Hello everyone. Whenever we see something like this, the first question that pops into our mind is, should I treat this with antibiotics? And that's good, this is a good start, but it's only half the story. We should also ask ourselves, is this something that I still need to treat, but it will not respond to our usual antibiotics? Group A streptococcus, or so-called strep, the most common cause of bacterial pharyngitis, has a strong propensity to infect the oropharynx. There, it causes a strong inflammatory response, which spills over to the surrounding lymphatic tissue, namely the tonsils and anterior cervical lymph nodes. So, in strep throat, you will see a patient with a sore throat and usually swollen tonsils with a lot of pus and painful swollen anterior cervical lymph nodes. Respiratory viruses, on the other hand, usually don't produce such severe symptoms and such a severe reaction in the lymphatic tissue, but in addition to infecting the oropharynx, they also infect the cells in the nasal cavity, in the nasopharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the sinuses, everything. So in viral pharyngitis, in addition to a sore throat, you will usually see other signs and symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection, like sneezing, cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, hoarseness, right? And with this picture in mind, it's easy to understand the logic behind the Centaur criteria, a scoring system that is most commonly used to tell the difference between viral and bacterial pharyngitis. So basically you add one point for each finding and the total score tells you how likely it is that you are dealing with strep throat as opposed to viral pharyngitis. So C stands for the absence of cough. But I would also add other C's like conjunctivitis, coryza. So, all of this should be absent in pure bacterial pharyngitis, namely strep throat. E stands for exudate. In strep throat, you will usually see these impressive swollen tonsils with a lot of exudate. This is not something that you will commonly see in viral pharyngitis. Now, sure, of course, there are exceptions. Some viruses can do that, like adenovirus or Epstein-Barr, the cause of infectious mononucleosis. We'll get to that. But for the most part, in viral pharyngitis, you don't get to see a lot of exudate. N stands for nodes. So again, these painful swollen anterior cervical nodes. A very common finding in strep throat, but relatively uncommon in viral pharyngitis. Now sure, viruses can cause lymphadenopathy, and they often do, but it's usually nowhere near as impressive as in strep throat. But again, there are exceptions. Once again, infectious mononucleosis. It can cause very impressive lymphadenopathy, but in addition to these anterior lymph nodes, in infectious mononucleosis, usually other nodes in other regions of the neck will be swollen as well, especially the lymph nodes behind the sternoclavicomastoid muscle right here. Other lymph nodes in other regions of the body can be swollen as well. So, so can be some organs that contain a lot of lymphatic tissue, like the liver and the spleen. Next, T stands for temperature. Most patients with strep throat will have a fever, usually their temperature will be above 38 degrees Celsius. With viruses, it depends. Many viruses can produce a high fever, like influenza, for example, but with many viral causes, the temperature is not that impressive. So, this is rather unspecific, but still, in strep throat, there should be a fever. And the final criterion is a little bit more complicated. The age of your patient also matters. So if your patient is between the ages of 3 and 14, you will add 1 point. If they are between 15 and 44, you will add 0. And if they are older than 44, you will subtract 1 point. Why does this matter? Well, most patients with strep throat will be children, teenagers, young adults. I'm not saying it's impossible for a 40-year-old to have strep throat only it's much less probable. So if you do see a 50 or 60 year old with something that looks like strep throat at first, it's time to stop and think. Yes, of course, it could still be strep throat, but you have to consider other possible explanations for your patient's symptoms. I always point out that the word throat is not very precise. When people say, I have a sore throat, this could mean anything. So this could be really the pharynx or the trachea, even the thyroid, maybe the floor of the mouth, right? So ask your patient, is it really the pharynx or something else? Because this will drastically change your differential diagnosis. But let's go back to Centaur criteria. The total score will tell you how likely it is that this actually is strep throat. And one key thing to notice here is that 
you cannot use central criteria on their own to confirm strep throat, but you can use them to exclude strep throat with a very high level of certainty. Because if the Centaur score is very low, strep throat is highly unlikely. On the other hand, even with the highest possible score, the probability of strep throat is around 50 to 60 percent, right? But the practical question is, do we really need to prove streptococcal infection to decide about antibiotics? And the truth is, we can't even agree on that. There are very big differences between different guidelines. For example, in most American guidelines, they put a strong emphasis on proof. If the score is two or above, you should take a swab of your patient's throat to confirm the diagnosis. The British, on the other hand, don't care much about testing. They put a stronger emphasis on the severity of symptoms as the most important variable in the decision making about antibiotics because they recognize that strep throat is for the most part mild and self-limited and that serious complications are extremely uncommon. European ESMID guidelines are somewhere in the middle. They do recognize that testing could be useful and it could probably improve your decision making, but they're not really sure. Now, my personal opinion is that if you do have the luxury of rapid tests, you should use them. The more information you have, the more knowledge you have, the better the decisions that you are going to make, but this is just my opinion. From the technical standpoint, you can choose from either rapid test or bacterial culture. The rapid test is, well, rapid, but it's not as sensitive as bacterial culture. Bacterial culture, on the other hand, takes a couple of days to complete. Now, whatever method you use, you need to make sure that you swab only the pharynx and the tonsils without touching the uvula or the rest of the oral cavity. Now, of course, this is easier said than done, especially in children, and you have to be quick, but with practice, you will get better. And to really appreciate the fact that you cannot use the center criteria to confirm strep throat without the swab, right? You should just take a look at infectious mononucleosis. It's a very common condition and it can present with a perfect center score. So, the absence of cough, of course, there is no cough. Exudate, tons of exudate. Nodes, even more impressive than strep throat. Temperature, definitely. Even the age fits. And this is why when you see a patient with exudative tonsillitis, you can't just say, oh, this is almost certainly strep throat. No, take your time. Take a close look at their lymph nodes, including the lymph nodes behind the stenoclavicomastoid muscle. Palpate their abdomen and look for signs of an enlarged liver or spleen. If you are still not sure, perhaps you have a rapid test for mono or for strep. If you don't, I hope that you can at least order a complete blood count with differential, because in strep throat there should be leukocytosis with neutrophilia. In infectious mononucleosis, on the other hand, usually there will be lymphocytosis. And if your analyzer can detect atypical lymphocytes even better, these two should be present in infectious mononucleosis. As a side note, in infectious mononucleosis, you also have to be aware of your patient's age, just like in strep throat, because infectious mononucleosis usually affects children, teenagers, young adults. It's rare above the age of 25 or 30, let's say. So, if you do see a patient who is older than 30 and they present with symptoms of infectious mononucleosis, again, it's time to stop and think. Why would this happen to this person? And is this really infectious mononucleosis or something else? Of course, again, it could be your garden variety mono, but there are other pathogens that can cause very similar symptoms, mononucleosis-like symptoms, most notably HIV. Acute HIV infection can present with a sore throat, lymphadenopathy, prolonged low-grade fever, malaise, fatigue, much like infectious mononucleosis. But some elements are different. For example, oral ulcers. This is highly unusual in infectious mononucleosis, but it's quite common in HIV. Generalized rash as well. Diarrhea, weight loss. All of this is quite common in acute HIV infection. But HIV and Epstein-Barr are not the only viral causes of pharyngitis that you need to pay attention to. There are proper respiratory viruses that are much more common. Number one, influenza. 
Now, for the most part, it is mild and self-limited, but for certain groups of patients, it can be way more dangerous. For example, people over 60 and people with chronic conditions. So, if it is influenza season and your patient presents with something that looks like influenza, so a fever, respiratory symptoms, including maybe a sore throat, right? If they belong to one of these high-risk groups, you should start treatment with antivirals as soon as possible. I already did a video on this. Again, if you want to learn more, I highly suggest that you take a look. COVID, same thing. For the most part, mild and self-limited, but for certain risk groups, it can be way more dangerous. Now, of course, this virus is still evolving and with it, the recommendations for treatment are evolving as well, but generally, the risk factors for severe disease are very similar to the ones in influenza. Again, advanced age and chronic diseases. And just like influenza, if you do suspect COVID, you should start antiviral treatment as soon as possible to prevent complications in these high-risk groups. The one good thing about COVID is that at least we have cheap, widely available and relatively reliable tests all around so we can diagnose it pretty rapidly and decide about treatment. And of course, even if your patient doesn't have any risk factors for severe disease, it's important for them to know that they're infected with influenza or SARS-CoV-2 so that they don't infect someone who is vulnerable. Now, in addition to all these viruses, there are some uncommon causes of bacterial pharyngitis like tularemia and some STDs. But what is more important than that? If you work with patients long enough, eventually you will stumble upon patients with life-threatening conditions that will mimic pharyngitis early on. So before you apply anything that you learned in this video, whenever you see a patient with a sore throat, First, you should look for signs of a potentially severe or even life-threatening illness. If you know what to look for, this will literally take seconds and you will learn all you need in my next video. Thank you for watching, good luck out there and take care.